Today we begin our story of the epic quest to find Muhammad in the Bible. As the movie opens, we meet our protagonist, whom we'll call Omar. Looking out from his new home, which he has just moved into with his first wife, Zara, three times he declares, Wow! It seems Omar is not confident in his own beliefs and must look to others for affirmation, much like our Muslim friends who, having no confidence in Islam's truth claims, look outside their faith, turning to a true authority, the Bible, to justify their belief. Looking out from his new home, Omar sees a neighborhood filled with joy. Omar has moved to the land of the infidels in hopes of a better life. Muhammad is a prophet, is he not? Why don't the infidels see it? He wonders. Muhammad is a true prophet. Muhammad is a true prophet. Isn't that true? It has to be true, right? Our imam wouldn't lie to us, would he? Omar has a plan. He has gathered up all the verses in the Bible. He takes his wife to see his evidence. Look at all those verses about Muhammad, he declares. Of course, he hasn't actually read any of them. Can you name one about Mo? Zara asks curiously. This half is the Torah, and this half is the Gospel, he replies. Can you be a little more specific? Nah, I don't feel like it right now. And didn't Zakir Naik already do all the work for us anyway? As they return home, doubt creeps in. What if I can't find a single verse about Muhammad? Omar asks. Zara replies, There are 31,000 verses in the Bible. Surely one is about Muhammad. Encouraged, Omar begins to initiate a mating ritual. But oh, what is going on? It seems jihadis have arrived to subjugate or kill the infidels, and everyone has fled. It'll be okay. Muhammad was a true prophet. Zara is not convinced and tries to run. Seeing her immense value as a sex slave, the jihadis pounce on the opportunity and move in. Omar tries to fight back, but he fails, and the scene goes to black. When he awakes, Omar will find that destruction has ensued. His wife is gone, his life is ruined, but maybe there is still hope. Maybe if he can find one verse in the Bible and prove Muhammad is a true prophet, then he can take a second wife from among the war captives and live in Islamic paradise. Thus begins the quest, finding Nomo. So we are going to dive right into it. Finding Nomo, the 1400-year search for Muhammad in the scriptures. And why I think this is such an important topic is because it is one of the few falsifiable claims that the Quran makes. So there are three such claims that we're going to cover here just briefly. Because what's really neat about a falsifiable claim is you can actually prove it true or prove it false, right? In a lot of other uh, ways, you can do some probabilities and things like that to determine, you know, does it logically make sense or uh, theologically make sense or is it the greatest probability? Um, but in these such falsifiable claims, you can absolutely determine whether or not the statements are true or false. So in Quran 482, uh, it basically says, if this were from anyone besides Allah, you would find in it much contradiction. The other one is, uh, you know, if this weren't a surah from Allah, then, you know, then why don't you go ahead and make a surah like it, right? Um, and then finally, the unlettered prophet in the Torah and the gospel, right? So the first two actually, to me, kind of sound a little bit like an insecure Allah, right? Who's saying, well, I, if you can do, you can't do better than me. Uh, whereas like the true God would just know that you can't do better than him, right? So the, the reason why we didn't hone in on much contradiction, although there are plenty of videos out there, there is plenty of contradictions within 
the scripture, the word much contradiction actually raises an eyebrow, right? Because when you're having a conversation with a Muslim, you can show them one contradiction and they'll be like, yeah, well, it says much contradiction. So uh, if there's more than, you know, much is more than one, but how many? Nobody, nobody really knows. So this is not a solid argument for us to be building. Uh, to make a surah like it, who's the judge on if it's better or worse, right? When I hear the Quran, I think almost everything is better than the Quran, but I know many Muslims who would hear somebody make up a, a verse or a poem or something, and automatically they're going to say, well, this isn't even nearly as good as the Quran, right? So it becomes more of a subjective claim. And so finally, we're going to get into the main claim that we're going to discuss in this upcoming series, right? So this is Surah 7, verse 157. This is also a falsifiable claim, and this is what it says. It says, those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they, the Jews and the Christians, find, this is a present tense verb, mentioned in their own scriptures and in the Arabic um, this is a word that literally means in between their hands, right? So it's a, it's a physical, it's an adverb of something that they hold physically. Uh, it's a location adverb, meaning that it is a scripture that was presently in the hands of the Jews and the Christians at the time of, rev of the revelation. So, uh, and we can find the messenger, the unlettered prophet written about in our scriptures in the law, which is the Torah and the Gospels. So this is something that we have the ability to look into. So let's quickly exegete Surah 7, 157. So the question is, who is the unlettered prophet, right? Can't read, can't write, that hasn't learned anything about anything else. Well, that's clearly Muhammad, right? Uh, it is written about in the Torah and the Gospel, right? So we know who it's about and we know where we can find this who written about, and we know specifically that this who is written about in the Torah, right? The, the books of Moses, the law, and the Gospels. Once again, a present tense verb. This is very important for us to remember. This means that the scriptures were there. We, this also means that it was written down, and it also means that Allah, or whoever is the author of the Quran, believed that our scriptures were preserved at least enough to find Muhammad written about. This is a law challenging people to go look into the scriptures, the Torah and the gospels to find Muhammad. So what does this imply? This implies that if there is no Muhammad, right? If, if we don't find Muhammad written about, this is very important for, for Muslims, that there is no Muhammad equals no Mo, which means that Islam is predicated on a false pretense. And therefore when it's not proven true when it's proven false it means that it's a false religion verifiable yes if we can find muhammad that means that muhammad is there and that muhammad might perhaps be a true prophet in the line of the biblical prophets and that means that islam might actually be a true religion so conclusions we can start drawing here if muhammad is in the torah and the gospel islam can be true if Muhammad is not in the Torah and the gospel, Islam cannot be true. So there are many, many Muslims who have claimed to have found Muhammad in our scriptures. Many Muslims are convinced that they found Muhammad. And once they read about him in these different surahs and, or these different verses in our Bible, and they believe that it is Muhammad, this actually strengthens their faith and verifies their Quran and their religion. However, just because they believe that they have found Muhammad doesn't actually mean in reality that they have. And that's what this series is for. This series is to help us find and to examine if the claims that they've made actually hold up to uh, examination and to scrutiny. So I'm going to give you guys a little quote here by Socrates, an unexamined life is not worth living. Or in other words, an unexamined belief is not worth having. So when we examine these statements, we're basically going to figure out one of two things. Is it Muhammad? Muhammad's in the verse. True or false? 
pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Now, there are ramifications to anybody holding false beliefs, right? We can all hold minor false beliefs, and they're usually benign. They don't really actually mean anything, right? But in the case of this, especially in the case of the nearly 2 billion Muslims, if they understand Surah 7, 157 and its implications, and they believe that Muhammad is actually written about in our scriptures, but he isn't, right? If he's not, then this belief is no longer benign. This belief can actually be the difference between salvation and condemnation. So one thing that I want us to all do, Christians and Muslims included, let's try to lay aside our presuppositions and our confirmation bias and all these things. And let's honestly and humbly examine the evidence, right? These are people made in the image of God, Christians and Muslims alike, and we all deserve to be respected and we all deserve to have our claims seriously examined so that we can determine whether or not they are true. Because if we just let people believe false things, including ourselves, then all we're doing is allowing people to be led astray and allowing people to enter into eternal condemnation. So just arrogantly boasting in a false belief, this doesn't need to be said, but I'm saying it, will not save you. However, humbly seeking the truth while tossing aside false beliefs for true ones might actually save you. So let's all be humble and see where the evidence takes us. So before we get into all of the implications of this, right, we're, we're going to assume that Muhammad is not found in our scriptures, right? We're going to disprove every single claim that, that Muslims have made. And so they're going to have a few different fallback arguments. So and once they realize Muhammad have uh, Hansel in the chat with one of those, he says, right. uh, Bible is good for nothing. It is a false yep. book. So he, he's a, asserting that the he can't go to the Bible for authority. And he says, Islam is the only truth. But then he <laughs> seems to contradict himself. He, someone yes. was uh, talking about um, Isaiah uh, uh, being a prophecy of Muhammad. He said, mm -hmm. we don't need Isaiah. Some Muslims do it. That's okay. So uh, either he says, it, you know, it, it's not there, but if you go there, no problem. Uh, very interesting ideas from Hansel here. And then he has a bunch of top, bunch of attempts to change the subject because he apparently doesn't really want to discuss this subject. We're, we're glad you're here, Hansel, but please stick to the subject. The, the Quran claims that Muhammad is in the Bible. If you are telling us he's not and the Bible is good for nothing, then you're contradicting the Quran. And I believe that's about it, where we are, that Astruf is about to say that. Yeah, I, I've had enough of these conversations to know exactly how this goes. So Hansel, uh, buddy, I really do pray that you're able to actually listen to this. Uh, because if we're speaking a, a falsehood here, then you will have every opportunity to expose what it is that we have said falsely. But if you're not listening and you're not paying attention, then you're going to be making arguments and trying to knock down straw men, which means that you're just doing nothing, essentially. You're wasting energy on making arguments that either go against what your own Quran and your own scriptures say, um, and or you're just making up false things about what we say. So if you're knocking down false things, you're knocking down essentially nothing. Right. So thank you, uh, Hansel, for um, giving us the fallback argument already. Muhammad is if if Muhammad is not found in our scriptures, they're going to say this something along the lines: your scriptures are corrupt. Right. Or they'll say, well, some of the scripture is corrupt, while the other part of it might be true still. So how do we address this corrupt scriptures thing just using the verse that we've spoken about, right? So Surah 7, 157, which I've already predicated on, so go back and listen to it if you haven't listened to it, um, makes it explicitly clear that Muhammad, the unlettered prophet, is found in between our hands, location adverb, in our scriptures, written about in our scriptures. 
This is a falsifiable claim. This is something where the author of the Quran says, go and look at the Christian and Jewish scriptures, namely the Torah, the books of Moses and the law and the gospels, right? So specifically go look into these books and you will find Muhammad written about. Either Muhammad is in there and is written about it, and therefore the statement the Quran made is true, or Muhammad is not described in those scriptures, and the author of the Quran made a false statement. This is something that we can actually do right now, and we're going to, and this is why we've put together this series, because it really is a very important question. This isn't about you know whose who's favorite soccer team or football team is gonna win uh, you know, the championship, this isn't a, a minor issue. This is about who is going to be following a true religion or who is going to be following a false religion. And um, the implications of that, of course, are someone, if they are believing the truth and following the truth, will enter into salvation. Whereas if someone is uh, woefully following a lie, they will be blindly led into condemnation. This is not an argument for pride. So I really hope that everyone in the chat, Christians and Muslims included, just listen, pay attention, and think about it. All right. So, so Hansel, if Muslims... I asked yeah. Hansel if he was ready to debate us, and he said, okay, I am ready, and then he retracted that. So clarify, Hansel, you, you ready to debate us? You ready to take on this topic or not? Yeah, Hansel, and, and we'll have plenty of time at the end of this uh, to to start to have a discussion. And every every week or so, depending on our schedule, we, we will have a specific topic, right? And we'll go over the um, I think it's eight different eight different sessions where we're covering eight different biblical passages where Muslims have said that they have found Muhammad. And so we're going to be able to break this down into very specific terms. So just please, just you know. Relax for a minute, pay attention, and then we'll be able to discuss whatever it is that you want to discuss at the end of the stream. So I'm going to go back to this here. One, Surah 7, 157 makes it explicitly clear that Muhammad is found in our scriptures. Muslims believe that our scriptures are reliable enough to find Muhammad, hence why they have been making these claims for the last 1400 years, which leads me to ask this question. Why seek for truth, right? Why seek for your Muhammad, which your Quran, which is supposedly the word of Allah, says you can find him in if you believe that the truth you're looking for is in a corrupted scripture? So this is what I find pretty interesting, right? The, the old saying, actions speak louder than words, right? So as we saw, uh, Muslims will claim corruption, at the same time, they will also act, they will take actions by reading the Bible and trying to find Muhammad in there, claiming that they have found him. This is clearly hypocrisy. In one way, with their words, they're saying it's corrupted. But in the other way, with their actions, they're looking at the Bible, they're reading it, and they're saying, we have found him. So which is it, Muslims? Is it corrupted? Or do you trust in it enough to think that Muhammad is found in your scriptures? After we clearly demonstrate through a proper exegesis of Surah 7, 157, they say, oh, well, the Bible is not totally corrupt, but some of it is. Some of it's true, right? So here's, here, here's my issue with it, right? Allah doesn't say that our Bible is corrupt. Allah doesn't say where it is corrupt or what has been corrupted within our scriptures. Allah doesn't say what part of it is reliable, except for all of it. There are 15 verses where Allah directly relies and claims and says that the Torah and the Injil and the Zabur, which is the Psalms, are his words and his words are incorruptible. So how do you know that the verses, right? So if, if you hold the view that part of it's corrupt and part of it's not, then I'm going to ask you, how do you know what verses are corrupted versus not corrupted? If you found Muhammad, maybe that's a corrupted verse. Well, we'll get into that. So here's another problem. Allah has no clue and Allah gives no clues 
for Muslims. There's no direction that he gives, right? So there are a couple of reasons why Allah gives no directions to Muslims where they can find Muhammad written about in our scriptures. It's either because he is ignorant and he's just saying that, hoping, you know, that maybe he's in there somewhere, like the video said at the beginning, you know, there's 31,000 verses in the Bible. Surely we can make one fit Muhammad. Or he knows he's not ignorant. He knows that Muhammad is not in the Bible, uh, which can only lead to one conclusion is that he enjoys watching his slaves find nothing or because he is the best of mockers, which is uh, translated as deceivers or Allah is just deceiving everyone. And he's just having a good old laugh, watching everybody run around, trying to find his favorite prophet written in a book that he corrupted. So, when we get into this, we find ourselves, we Muslims find themselves in a major dilemma. I'm going to call this the Mocker Dilemma, the Macarena Dilemma. I don't know what I'm going to call it. We're going to go with the Macarena. <laughs> I, I like Macarena. Yeah. Macarena. All right. So we're going to, ah, uh, Macarena. All right. So here's the deal Allah is deceiving Muslims. This is one of the options it could be. Allah is deceiving Muslims because he knows, right? Assuming he's not ignorant. He, he knows that Muhammad isn't in our scriptures. Or Allah is deceiving the Jews and Christians because he corrupted our scriptures. Or let's just say we go with number two. The Jews and Christians have been deceived by Allah because he corrupted our scriptures. But if he corrupted our scriptures, he's also been a deceiver to the Muslims and both parties are deceived. So the issue is here, guys, is no matter which way you slice it, uh, you, you have to make Allah either completely ignorant or a massive deceiver. Uh, be, given those two choices, it's like, which way would you like to lose? I, I don't know which way you wanna lose. So I know we've covered a lot of things, so I'm gonna give us a real brief review. So Quran 7, 157 says that Muhammad can be found written about in our scriptures. Our scriptures are Allah's words. Uh, Surah or chapter 6, 115 of the Quran says explicitly, no man can change Allah's words. So if you are a Muslim who was trying to say that our scriptures were changed, by men, you're making all kinds of implications against Allah and your own scriptures. So Allah doesn't say where Muhammad might be found, gives no hints. Allah doesn't give us, sorry, and, and then uh, we're finding out and we have found out that the Muslim fallback arguments are in fact condemning to their own Quran, to this own verse, which we have exegeted for you. So I want to dive into Surah 6, 115, because this is a major dilemma as well. If you are a Muslim who wants to claim that the Torah and the Gospels and the Psalms have been corrupted, then you're going directly against what your Quran says. It says, no man can change Allah's words. But Muslims will claim corruption anyway. So if you claim corruption and you are Muslim, you have now found yourself in a beautiful dilemma. Either man did corrupt the incorruptible words of Allah, which makes Allah the opposite of potent or powerful. And I like to say Allah is impotent. Man did not corrupt the words of Allah because Allah, if you're going to hold to the, the belief that it was corrupted, that means that Allah corrupted his own words, which would then lead you to conclude that Allah is malicious and deceptive. So do you want Muslims to, to claim that the, by, that the scriptures, our scriptures are corrupted? Do you really want to do that? Because when you do, you either make a law impotent, malicious, and or deceptive. It's a terrible argument to say that it's been corrupted. So again, fallback arguments lead to a law being ignorant because he didn't know Muhammad wasn't in our scriptures or a law is impotent because he was unable to preserve his own words or a law is malicious. He changed his own words so that Muslims couldn't find Muhammad written in them. Pick your poison Muslims. Do you want a law to be ignorant, impotent or malicious? 
Some it has to be one or options. all some combination thereof, right? No, it's it's incredibly sad. So if you want to use that fallback argument, just know where we're going to take it. If you don't want to use the fallback argument, then you have one last hope. The irony here is that the Islam's last hope is in the Bible. Muhammad must be in the Bible. Because if Muhammad is not in our Bible, then that means only one thing, that the Quran is wrong, Allah is either ignorant, impotent, or malicious, or Muhammad is a false prophet. So the only hope that Muslims have is in our Bible. I'm going to repeat that one more time. The only hope Muslims have is in our Bible. So I'm going to just say this. If the Bible is reliable enough to verify Muhammad, the Bible is also reliable enough to falsify Muhammad. So here's the deal. The desperate dean, Islam's top scholars. Uh, I'm going, we're, we're going to click on this and this, but if you just go to QuranX.com and you go to Surah 7, verse 157, you will see that there is, uh, you'll see the verse and then uh, right next to the verse, you'll see 43 roots and five tafsirs. If you just click on the tafsir, you can read it yourself. Okay. I'm going to read out loud for you. Just trust that it's there. And if you want to verify me, please go ahead and look at it. So Ibn Abbas says those that about this verse, this is his commentary on this verse. Those who follow the messenger, the religion of the messenger, the prophet who can neither read nor write, i.e. Muhammad, right? So Ibn Abbas here is clearly identifying the unlettered prophet as Muhammad, whom they will find with his traits and description described in the Torah and the gospel, which are with them. Thaddeus, I'm going to pause here for a second and ask you a question. Mm -hmm. When he says the Torah and the gospel, find the traits and descriptions of him, which are with them. What does that mean that the, the Torah and the gospel are with the Jews and the Christians? It would seem to me that he's referring to the Torah and the gospel that they had available mm -hmm. during the time of Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Right. So that would imply that our scriptures, at least at that time, were corrupted or not corrupted. That would be not corrupted. Okay, great. Now, I, I have another question for you, Thaddeus. Um, you know, it, uh, Muhammad's quote unquote revelations were between the year 610 and 632 AD. Do we have any complete Bibles from before that time that we could compare what we have today to see if it's been corrupted from, from then to now? Do we have any? In fact, we have many. Yeah, we've got hundreds, if not thousands of Bibles that predate the time of the quote unquote revelation. And we can look at them and we can read them. And by golly, Thaddeus, what do we find? They all say the same thing, right? So if the Bible and uh, if the Torah, the gospel and the Psalms were all reliable then, and they're exactly the same as they are now. And we can verify that by getting our hands on copies, reading them, seeing pictures, et cetera, et cetera. Then does that mean that our, our uh, gospel and Torah and Psalms have been corrupted at all? It would seem that they haven't been. I mean, if Allah, and he's all knowing, right? If he says that they're not corrupted at the time of Muhammad, and we still have ex cut copies of the Gospels and Torah that were available at that time, uh, and they're the same, that would seem to suggest that they're not corrupted, which is actually consistent with what Allah claims throughout the Quran, that the, his word is uncorruptible, that no one can change mm -hmm. his words. And then Muslims come around and they say, well, yeah, we don't really believe Allah. We only believe... We believe that the Apostle Paul or Constantine or whoever <laughs> else corrupted the, the Gospel. 
Um, I also was able to zoom in on your text on my end. So it's now. Yeah, I noticed that, man. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I kind of highlighted the, the, the bit that I'm reading. Um, so a, as you can keep scrolling down through here, w w what I'm looking for is specific claims. Where in our scriptures? Where in our scriptures? The book of Isaiah, the Deuteronomy, uh, the Gospel of John, what's going on, right? So Abbas doesn't say anything. So now we can move on to Jala Lane. Those who follow the messenger, sorry, I'm going to try to highlight. Those who follow the messenger, the uninstructed prophet Muhammad, whom they find inscribed in their Torah and gospel. I'm going to pause here again. Whom they find inscribed in their Torah and their gospel. Um, uh, is this present tense, past tense? What, what, what words are we using here, Thaddeus? Yeah, there's going to be present tense here again. It's present tense, right? Meaning that when Jala Lane was writing this, in the present tense, you can find Muhammad inscribed in the Torah, in the gospel. This is what's fun. In name. <laughs> so he must be found in name, according to Jala Lane, and description. Right. And then it goes on to say he does blah, 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 blah. Right. But there's nothing in this part that says where you can find him. It just says in general, Torah and gospel. OK. Uh, Kashani, I don't even know how to say this guy's name. Those who follow the messenger, the uninstructed prophet at the end of time, that is Mohammedans who fear of God, follow description where he says to him, blah, 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 blah. Sorry, I'm just reading this. Okay, so he doesn't even say, this guy leaves out the Torah and the gospel. I wonder why he left that out. Everybody loves Ibn Kathir, right? Those who follow the messenger, the prophet, who can neither read nor write, whom they find written about with them. So he even goes so far as to use the word with them. So that means that this Torah and gospel was with the Christians and the Jews at the time. Everything that I've already said, I'm just going through this, showing you that this is not just me making things up. These are Islam's top scholars and commenters about this particular verse. This is the description of Prophet Muhammad in the book of the prophets. Okay, where can we find him, right? We can scan through this. Does Kathir tell us we found him anywhere? Where does he say? Where, right? And, and how much longer did Kathir come after Muhammad? They had a few hundred years, right, of um, figuring out where Muhammad was. Yeah, I don't, uh, see... I don't, I don't know the exact date offhand, but it, it's definitely right. at least uh, 100, 200 years after the time of Muhammad. Yeah, I think he was medieval. He was like maybe the 1200s or something. Anyway, finally, we get to a scholar Malduti. Malduti says the same things everybody else says, and then he gives us something, something really, really important. There are clear references in the Bible to the coming of Muhammad. For instance, see Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19, Matthew 21, 33 through 4v, which should be 40, but uh, you know, whatever. John 1, 19 through 21, John 14, verse 15 to 17, John 14, verses 25 to 30, John 15, 25 to 26, and John 16, 7 through 15. Out of all of these five top Islamic scholars, nobody until the 20th century, this is when Maldudi was born, gives an actual reference now, Allah failed to give a reference. We all know that. So we have to re uh, rely on scholars who came 1,300 years later to finally read our Bible uh, and come up with these different places, right? So like I said, only the 20th century scholar makes any such claims, which we just went over. Pop level Mohammedan claims also include De Deuteronomy 32, one of my personal favorites, Song of Solomon 5, uh, 16. Uh, Thaddeus, I know you kind of enjoy Isaiah 29. And uh, the most modern and most proud, who uh, we already saw a Muslim say, Isaiah 42.
And we're going to cover all of these, but I'm just going to make this blanket statement here, guys. When we read the Quran, it says very specifically two books. It doesn't even say the Psalms, by the way. It does not say the Zabur. It says the law or the Torah, right? Which uh, remind me, Thaddeus, what, what books are considered um, Moses's law? That would be just the first five books of the Old Testament. Right. Yet so Genesis, Exodus, go. yeah, Levit Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy, right? Yep. And of those, the only one they ever go to is Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. And then Interesting. they go to Isaiah. They go to mm -hmm. Song of Solomon. They go to. But wait, wait, wait. Hold on, Thaddeus. Hold on. <laughs> We said five books, but but the in the Quran says the Torah and the law. Is Song of Solomon and Isaiah considered written by Moses and the law? The, clearly, no. it has to be, right? No, but it, it's not. It, you know, Allah doesn't seem to know that those books existed. Yet modern Muslims tell us that's where Muhammad's found. Strange. Hmm. Interesting. So if, if you want to have an elevator speech when anybody brings up anything besides Deuteronomy and John, you can just say, not in the gospel. Or sorry, I guess they can bring up Matthew. But if, if they bring up anything besides the first five books of Moses and the gospels, it can't possibly be a claim about Muhammad because it's not considered any of those, any of those books. All right, moving on. Muhammad is, so here, here are the possible conclusions. Again, I'm harping on this because I'm really, really hoping that our Muslim audience understands the implications of what they are claiming. So if Muhammad is written about in our scriptures, this leads us to believe that Allah thought our scriptures are reliable and that Muhammad is a prophet. So if our scriptures are reliable, then there are scriptures which say that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life is also reliably true. If our scriptures are reliable, then that means that Jesus was indeed crucified as a ransom for our sins. If we conclude that our Bible is reliable, that means that Jesus was buried for three days and resurrected bodily. And if we believe our scriptures are true, this also means that Jesus is God which leads us to our final conclusion. If we find Muhammad written about in our scriptures and it proves that our scriptures are true, then that means that the, the Quran is still wrong and Muhammad is a false prophet because the Quran denies the crucifixion of Jesus. It denies his atonement and it denies his divinity. So even if we find Muhammad in our scriptures, it means Islam is wrong. Isn't that sad? However, if Muhammad is not written in about our, in our scriptures, that means basically the same thing. The Quran is wrong, Allah is a false God, and Muhammad is a false prophet. So any which way we splice it, the Quran finds itself in a major dilemma. It's wrong one way, or it's wrong another way. What do you think about that, Thaddeus? Yeah, well, I think that the logic is absolutely solid here. And what Muslims don't seem to understand is they can only go to the Bible if it has authority. Um, when I had a chat with Safraz, who was here earlier but seems to have left, about Isaiah 42, he, I gave him a chance to make an introductory statement, and he said that Muhammad is found in the Bible, and it's found in the Hindu scriptures, and it, it, it's found all over the place, the name Muhammad. And I, and I probed him a little bit, and I got him to realize that the, if there's a true prophecy about someone, it authenticates the scriptures, too. It doesn't just authenticate the person that it's talking about. And I was like, yeah, you might want to stop claiming that Muhammad is found in the Hindu scriptures. I mean, you can claim it all you want. <laughs> if you want to say that, that Hinduism is, is a true religion according to Islam, by all means, go ahead and do that. But then, so they, they can legitimately, in principle, legitimately say that if Muhammad is prophesized in the Bible, that provides some authority to Muhammad. Of course, if he was prophesized as a false prophet, that would only verify that he's a false prophet. Mm -hmm. But, you know, given that 
for the sake of argument, let's say there is a prophecy about Muhammad in the Bible that uh, it says that he's coming as a, a true prophet. Well, mm -hmm. that authenticates the Bible, which means that we can Indeed. believe the rest of it. And the rest of it contradicts the message of Islam. So, big problem there. Maybe, maybe uh, Uthman corrupted the Quran. Maybe Muhammad was a true <laughs> prophet, and he brought, mm -hmm. uh, he just affirmed the gospel like the Quran claims, and mm -hmm. then Uthman corrupted the Quran. I mean, it's a lot more plausible than uh, Paul corrupting the Bible. Let's put it that way. It is, and and but both of those implications would mean that Paul is more powerful than Allah in preserving Allah's words. And so apparently is Uthman more powerful than Allah since Allah is unable to corrupt his own words or Allah um, forced these men to corrupt the scriptures because he wanted the scriptures corrupted. And Allah is the one who corrupted the scriptures, me meaning Allah is a deceiver, which might be about the only true thing he has said in his own book. Um, and uh, he's he's just malicious. So again, it really comes down to: Do you want your God to be impotent, or do you want your God to be malicious? You you you, you lose both ways, but you just have to figure out which way you want to lose. Definitely. All right. So, what should we be expecting in these upcoming sessions, Thaddeus? Um, so we broke it down into eight different things based on the claims from the 20th century scholar Malduti and also based on the pop level um, arguments made from just general general Muslims, right? So first video that we're going to do is Deuteronomy 18, second Deuteronomy 32, Song of Solomon, Isaiah uh, 29 and 42, Matthew 21, 33 to 40, John 1, 19, and then John chapter 14 through 16. So we're going to get eight different sessions where we're going to really be able to uh, dive deeply into the understanding of the scriptures to figure out whether or not Muhammad is actually prophesied in our scriptures. Um, uh, I'll leave you guys to guess what our conclusions might be, but <laughs> let, look, let's let's keep an open mind about it, and uh, let's be as charitable as possible when we're going through these types of things, and let's also pray that if we as Christians are wrong, that our eyes are open to the truth. And if Muslims are, are incorrect and to what they believe, that they will be, uh, you know, throw, throw aside false beliefs and embrace true beliefs. Pretty, pretty straightforward and pretty simple. When we're going through this, um, when we're talking about the Islamic claims, uh, I also want us to be able to pull into the, the view of all of us and to the front of our minds what competent authorship looks like, right? Because uh, the, the Quran is not the only book that claims that it's been fulfilling prophecies, right? The, the Bible itself claims that it is fulfilling prophecies and the authors of the Bible worked together, right? To, it, to show us and to demonstrate when a prophecy was being fulfilled, right? So how you know a prophecy is being fulfilled according to the Bible is you will see direct quotations from other scriptures. You will also see strong allusions from different scriptures. I'm not going to go incredibly deeply into each and every single one of these unless someone wants me to. Um, I'm going to leave this up to homework for the audience, right? So here are some direct quotations. Mark chapter 1, verses 2 to 3, directly quotes from Isaiah 40, verse 3, and Malachi 3, verse 1. This is where um, Mark is saying that, um, th that one will have a voice crying in the wilderness, preparing the way for the Lord. Okay, And then John the Baptist is identified as that voice in the wilderness, preparing the way for the Lord. Now, this one's one of my favorite ones. That's why I put it here first, and I will exegete this a little bit, and Thaddeus, I'll let you help me out here. So when Mark's quoting Isaiah 40 and Malachi 3, we know in the Old Testament, Lord um, is oftentimes uh, in all caps. So when it is in all caps, what was the original Hebrew word used for that? That would be the divine name, Yahweh. 
Mm -hmm. right which is yahweh so when we read mark verses or chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 and we see isaiah 40 verse 3 the word of the lord that they use there is yahweh and the and that same is true for malachi 3 1 the year the the word is yahweh so um Mar, uh, John the Baptist is preparing the way. He is the voice in the wilderness preparing the way for Yahweh. And then John the Baptist identifies the one whom he was preparing the way for. Who does John identify as the one he was preparing the way for, Thaddeus? Uh, that would be Jesus. Okay. Real quick. Let's do the math. If... Isaiah and Malachi are saying that the voice in the wilderness is preparing the way for Yahweh. And John is the voice in the wilderness preparing the way for Yahweh. And John identifies Jesus as the one whom he was preparing the way for. What does that mean Jesus is? Uh, that would mean that he is the one prophesied by the Old Testament, according mm -hmm. to the author of John. He right. seems and to he know... Is he knows the prophecy mm -hmm. and he directly relates it to Jesus. Contrast mm -hmm. this to prof, uh, the Quran, who just claims that prophecies exist, doesn't give you any mm -hmm. specifics. Right. And as importantly it, is that it identifies Jesus as Yahweh. This is a direct identification of Jesus as Yahweh by using explicit quotes from the Old Testament. Testament. This is how coherent authors work together all of these things. All right, moving on. Luke 4, 16 to 21 directly quotes Isaiah 61. And by the way, this is when Jesus is speaking. Jesus speaks this. And after he speaks this, he says, in the hearing of this, this prophecy has been fulfilled. It literally says that Jesus opened up the scroll of Isaiah and read, right? Isaiah. So what Jesus reads is Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 2, which contain within it either direct quotes from other places in the scripture or direct allusions to other places in the scripture, such as Psalm 46 uh, 7 through 8, Isaiah 42 verse 7, Isaiah 58 verse 6, Leviticus 25, 10, and Isaiah 49, verse 8. Again, I'm going to keep saying this. This is how coherent authors write things to let you know that things are being fulfilled. Other direct quote, quotation, Acts chapter 2 directly quotes from Joel 2, 28 to 30, Isaiah 32, 15, Isaiah 44, 3, Ezekiel 36, 27, Psalm 16, 8 through 11, Psalm 98, verse 1, and Psalm 110, verse 1. This is how coherent authors demonstrate to you where to look to confirm that a prophecy is being fulfilled other ones and I'm, I'm getting getting close to the end here guys i just want to show this to you matthew 27 uh, verse 46 and mark 15 verse 34 directly quotes the words of jesus my god my god why have you forsaken me this is a direct quotation of psalm 22. muslims this is a terrible argument if you try to say that jesus thinks god has forsaken him just Shut your yap for a second. Open up the Bible to Psalm 22 and read it alongside the passion narrative of Jesus and the exact scene that's going that he is going through at that moment. And you will realize that Jesus is simply speaking this to say, look at what I am fulfilling. Luke 22, 37 directly quotes Isaiah 53, 12. John 3, 14 directly, uh, it's more of an illusion, but it quotes Numbers 21, 9. Look into this. This is how coherent authors work together to prove that a prophecy is being fulfilled. They show you where it is. They tell you where it is. They directly quote from where it is. The Quran, on the other hand, the infallible Allah, on the other hand, doesn't give any clues. So the Bible is actually Akbar, right? Greater 
than the Quran when it comes to authorship and coherency. And this is really important for all of us to remember, right? Counterfeits detest examination. Counterfeits just give general blanket statements. They don't want you to examine them. I use Oakley sunglasses or Rolex watches as, as examples here, right? Um, they don't want these fake companies making fake watches and fake Oakley glasses. They don't want you to really examine if they are genuine or not. However, genuine things, they want and they want you to examine them to determine that they are true. The Quran doesn't ask us to examine them, or if it does, it gives silly falsifiable claims. And the Bible says, ask, seek, and knock. It says, look into these things. Paul talks to the Bereans and says that they looked into everything that he says. The Bible wants examination. We want you to examine the Bible because we know that the Bible is genuine. If we were counterfeit, we wouldn't want you to look into these things. So the Bible and the New Testament invites examination, and so much so that it has it is undivorced from the Old Testament. They come together. When you buy a Bible, most Bibles, you get the Old Testament and the New Testament all in one binding. The Quran claims to be in line with the Old Testament and the New Testament, or at least the Torah, the Gospels, and the Psalms. And yet, when I buy Qurans, I have never once seen it attached to the Torah or the Gospels or the Psalms. I wonder why that is. So yeah, Jesus, like I said, encouraged... Say what? I said, good question. I know, right? So Jesus encourages the examination of scriptures. Paul encur encourages the examination of, scripture, of scriptures. The Bible <coughs> excuse me, tells the reader exactly where to look for fulfilled prophecies. The Quran, in comparison, appears ignorant, shifty, and afraid of examination. The Quran, my friends, is daif.